Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Strand. My name is Peter, and I help direct the events here, where books uh, have been loved for over 92 years. For a little bit of history, Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on what was then Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, uh, Book Row gradually dwindled until, after over 92 years, Strand is the sole survivor, still run by the Bass family, running 400 events a year, and still housing new and used books. Tonight, I am so excited that one of those events gets to be with Elizabeth Strout, who is here to celebrate and discuss Olive again. Picking up with the unforgettable Olive Kittredge, hit heroine of the eponymous Pulitzer Prize-winning novel, it finds Elizabeth in pitch-perfect form, examining the quotidian and transcendent in the lives of Olive and the people of Crosby, Maine. Elizabeth's stories and novels have brought her numerous other prizes, including the Story Prize and finalist spots for the Booker Prize, the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction, and many others, and seen her grace the New York Times bestseller list with notable frequency. I'm doubly thrilled that Meg Walzer is here to discuss Olive as well. Meg is the New York Times bestselling author of The Female Persuasion, The Interestings, The Uncoupling, The Tenure Nap, The Position, The Wife, and Sleepwalking, as well as the young adult novel Belzar. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. There, uh, three of these have been adapted into films as well, and she's taught at the University of Iowa's Writers' Workshop, Skidmore College, and most recently, Princeton University. It's a real honor to have these two fantastic writers here, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Meg, Elizabeth, and Olive to the stream. Hi, everybody. Hello. This is working? This is yeah. on? Okay, great. I think so, right? Okay, good. Wow, this is so exciting to be in this beautiful, beautiful room uh, surrounded by books and people. Um, two of my favorite things. Um, <laughs> Liz, we have been friends for a very long time, uh, so I'm really, really happy to be in conversation with you. Although I was thinking that the phrase in conversation is something that Olive would really hate. Yes. <laughs> I definitely think yes, so. Yes, Olive would hate that. To start things off, would you give us a kind of little amuse-bouche from the book? Would you read a little bit? Sure, I'd be happy okay. to. I'll read, um, yeah, I'll read for a long time. <laughs> How would that We've be? locked the doors. <laughs> it's going to be like Est. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. OK. So I'm actually, I'm going to read the first three pages of um, the story called The Poet, because this was the first story or chapter that I wrote, because I don't write from beginning to end, and this was the first, my re-entry into Olive. On a Tuesday morning in the middle of September, Olive Kittredge drove carefully into the parking lot of the marina. It was early. She drove only in the early hours now, and there were not many cars there, as she had expected there would not be. She nosed her car into a space and got out slowly. She was 82 years old and thought of herself as absolutely ancient. For three weeks now, she had been using a cane, and she made her way across the rocky pathway, not glancing up so as to be able to watch her footing. But she could feel the early morning sun and sense the beauty of the leaves that were turned already to a bright red at the tops of the trees. Once inside, she sat at a booth that had a view of the ocean and ordered a muffin and scrambled eggs from the girl with a huge hind end. The girl was not a friendly girl. She hadn't been friendly in the years she'd worked there. Olive stared out at the water. It was low tide, and the seaweed laid like combed, rough hair all in one direction. The boats that remained in the bay sat graciously, their thin masts pointing to the heavens like tiny steeples. Far past them was Eagle Island and also Puckerbrush Island, with the evergreens spread across them, nothing more than a faint line seen from here. When the girl, who practically slung the plate of eggs with the muffin onto the table, said, hands on her hips, anything else? Olive just gave a tiny shake of her head, and the girl walked away, one haunch of white pants moving up, then coming down as the other haunch moved up, up and down, huge slabs of hind end. In a patch of sunlight on the table, Olive's, Olive's rings twinkled on her hand, which sight, lit in such a way, gave her the faintest reverberation of surprise, wrinkled, puffy. This was her hand. And then minutes later, just as she had put another bite of scrambled egg onto her fork, Olive spotted her, Andrea LaRue. For a moment, Olive couldn't believe it was the girl. Not a girl, she was a middle-aged woman, but at Olive's age, they were all girls. And then she thought, why not? Why wouldn't it be Andrea? 
The girl, Andrea, sat at a booth by herself. It was a few booths away from Olive, and she faced Olive, but she sat staring out at the water with tinted glasses halfway down her nose. Olive placed her fork on her plate, and after a few moments, she rose slowly and walked up to Andrea's booth, and she said, Hello, Andrea. I know who you are. The girl woman turned and stared at her, and for a moment Olive felt she had been mistaken. But then the girl woman took her off her tinted glasses, and there she was, Andrea, middle-aged. There was a long moment of silence. It seemed long to Olive, before Olive said, So, you're famous now. Andrea kept staring at Olive with eyes that were large. Her dark hair was pulled back loosely in a ponytail. Finally, she said, Mrs. Kittredge? Her voice was deep, throaty. It's me, Olive said. It is I, and I've become an old lady. She sat down across from Andrea, in spite of thinking that she saw in the girl's face a wish not to be disturbed. But Olive was old. She had buried two husbands. What did she care? She did not care. You've gotten smaller, Andrea said. Probably. Olive folded her hands on the table and then put them onto her lap. My husband died four months ago, and I don't eat as much. I still have an appetite, but I'm not eating as much, and when you get old, you shrink anyway. Andrea said after a moment, you do? Shrink? Of course you do. Your spine gets crunched up, your belly pops out, and down you go. I can't be the first person you've seen get old. You're not, Andrea agreed. Well then, so you know. Bring your plate over, said Andrea, looking past Olive to where Olive had been sitting. Wait, I'll get it for you. And she scooted from her seat and in a moment returned with Olive's plate of eggs and the muffin and also a Olive's cane. She was shorter than Olive had thought, childlike almost. Thank you, Olive said. I only started with the cane three weeks ago. I had a little car accident is what happened. I was in the parking lot near Chewy's and I stepped on the gas pedal instead of the brake. Andrea opened her hand slightly and said with a friendly half grimace, that's fair. Not if you're 82 years old, then everyone seems ready to take away your license. Although I must say the policeman was very nice. I wept. Can you imagine? I still can't believe I did, but I stood there and I wept. Awfully nice man, the policeman and the ambulance people. They were nice too. Were you hurt? Andrea asked. Cracked my sternum. God, Andrea said. It's fine. Olive pulled her jacket closed. I move more slowly, and now I just drive in the early morning. Try to, anyway. I totaled two cars in the parking lot that day. <laughs> two? Two, that's right. Well, three, if you count mine. I had to get my friend Edith's husband, Buzzy Stevens, to help me get another car when the insurance check came in. I don't think Buzzy cared much for that, but there we are. No one was hurt, just me. Shook me up, I will say. Well, of course, Andrea said in her deep voice. I saw you on Facebook that you were just in Oslo, said Olive. She ate some of her egg. You follow me on Facebook? Are you serious? Of course I'm serious. You just had a whole Scandinavian tour doing poetry readings. I went to Oslo with my second husband. I've had two husbands, Olive said. And with my second husband, we went to Oslo and took a boat, a cruise, I guess it was, around the fjords. They were beautiful. They were. My word. But then Jack got sad, and then I got sad, and we both said, it's beautiful here, but not as pretty as home. We felt better once we'd figured that out. Olive wiped her nose with a paper napkin that was on the table. She felt as though she was panting. Liz, this book is so great. It is so great. And it's filled with that thing called felt life. And I was thinking um, how when I was reading it, I could, I sort of could hardly breathe and the world fell away. And I was reminded of something that my publisher once said, which is that in a book, the reader has to want to be there, has yeah. to want to go there. What is it? I mean, I really don't understand. This is not rhetorical. What is it about Olive that we all really want, do you know what I'm talking about? Like you wanted more of it, like when you saw that there was another one of these books, right? It's like, what, like, what is it? Do you know that no. makes her so magnetic? <laughs> Can we maybe try to figure it out tonight? You know, I don't, I'm really, I don't know her appeal, except I feel it, I feel her appeal, but I made her, so I'm not, the right person to ask. No, maybe. but you're not. <laughs> but I, don't you ever feel like, well, I'm not such a freak that other people might feel that same way too, you know? And that's, I think, the case here. It's like you discovered something, like you want as much time as you can have around this person. What yeah. Do, but what, I mean, 
Well, she's very honest. Yeah. Because people talk about likability and unlikability. I mean, I know that's a big conversation in fiction, and but that's one of the things that people have talked about with this character. But maybe honesty is really more I mean, what I, we're talking about. I, th- I, th- I think that is part of her appeal, is that she is just who she is. She's absolutely who she is, and there's no extra stuff going on. Do you have complicated feelings about her or just simple? Oh, no, simple. I just love her. Yeah. But I understand she's... Well, but what but, is I it? mean, it doesn't bother me if other people don't, but I do because I made her, so I love her. What does it mean to love a person, a character? It just means that I... Um, you know, I, I have... I don't judge her at all. And, and that's one of the, um, for me, that's one of the best parts of writing is that when I go to the page, I don't, I suspend judgment on my characters. And that's so freeing. And Olive is, um, it's especially freeing because she's Olive and she's going to misbehave. So I just allow her to do that. And I think that's a form of love. It's like she gets a special dispensation from you. Well, she's pretty difficult. And I remember when I wrote the first Olive Kittredge, I can remember exactly where I was standing in a cottage in Provincetown, and I had worked on her all day. And that night, I was standing there, and I was looking out of the window, and I thought, oh, you know, she's awfully difficult. (laughs) And then I thought, no, you let her be Olive. And it was a moment that I always remembered. And That's I great. thought, no, not, not going to protect anybody, including her. Let her go. It's kind of a great rule for fiction writers, I think, generally, yeah. too, because it, it's a kind of anti-intrusive rule. Right. right. You're letting her Right, exactly. She herself. is who she is, so just do it. Right. And I'm not going to try and control it too much. <laughs> we, did, we did an event at the New York Society Library, uh, I think it was in 2011, and it was on the it was on the subject of characters and creating characters. And you said, and I'll, I, I'll probably get this wrong, but you said when, how the book began, how the original book, how Olive Kitteridge began, you saw a very large woman standing by a picnic table. Yeah, exactly. And You're that was it. Right. And you were comfortable then beginning a book that way. Right. Well, I heard the inside of her head think, I heard her thinking to herself, it's high time everyone went home. <laughs> And that was when I realized, oh, she's somebody that needs to get, I need to get this written down. And I understood right away that she was at her son's wedding. Right. (laughs) So basically, it's almost like, it's like that children's book, if you give a mouse a cookie, you create this person and then there's a line of dialogue and then there's a context. And now that's how something just gets formed, right? Right, that's right. And you had to trust your instinct. Right. Right, and you just, did. so you began writing with nothing, armed with nothing more than that. No, that's all. It was plenty. <laughs> and it came. And Her it just voice. came. Yeah. Um, how did the sequel... Well, do you call it a sequel? I, I don't call it anything. I don't know what to call it. I, I just mean, call it a book. I know. How did the new one... How did this one come about? Um, I really thought that I was done with Olive. I never expected ever to, to revisit her. But I was, um, I was in Norway for um, a weekend by myself. Yep. Um, parked there for various reasons and and I went to a cafe and um, and she showed up again she just showed, she showed up exactly that part that I read I could see her in her car nosing her way into the marina getting out she had a cane and I could see her looking down with the trees above and I just thought wow I have to write this down so I did and then rather soon I thought okay let's have her meet so, oh, let's have her meet the former poet laureate. Right, huh. right, right. Oh, what fun. <laughs> so you, you have pulled in characters in this book. Well, the book came out this week. So has anybody here actually read it? Yeah. Oh, great. I'm going to have to ask the rest of you to leave. This is just, this is between us. Um, I don't think we'll give anything away uh, too important. No. But um, you have pulled in characters from your previous books. Right. Which is like this wonderful old home week. Right. Did that just occur to you to do? Yeah, I mean, that just happened. You know, like, the Burgess boys showed up. I mean, I, I, I remember I was walking down the street in Maine one day, and all of a sudden, and it was summer, and I thought, oh, 
oh, it just came to me. I thought, Helen and Bob Burgess would be up in Maine dropping their grandson off at camp because that's what New Yorkers do. They take <laughs> their kids to camp in the summer in Maine. And I was so excited. And then I realized, well, actually, Bob Burgess just lives an hour away, so let's get him moved to Crosby. Right. And that was just so fun. Because you And then, you know, the whole New York culture versus the main culture, which is so interesting to me, gets played out in that story. Well, you're just populating your own world. Yeah. Which is fabulous, <laughs> which is really great. Yeah. One thing that I definitely want to talk about is how funny this book is and how Thank funny you. your I, writing is. Because Thank it's, you. I think... It, <laughs> I actually think this book is very funny. It really it is. It's saying. But what? So how does humor? How does does humor just incidentally pop out? Yeah, I don't. I mean, I never. I wouldn't know how to try and be funny. You know, that's something I. You know, I can't do that. But, but it just it just shows up. You know what I as think? As I'm going along. It seems to me to be connected to something you said right at the start about honesty. Because we were all Maybe. laughing at the haunches right. and, and the hind parts, right? Hind. The word hind, like, hind I imagine I know, hind I love end. It. <laughs> if I were seven years old, I would like fall on the floor laughing and dying right. the way children laugh at butt in a way. And I. Right. It's the honesty of that. Right. It's a fabulous phrase. Oh my God. I think. But then once you knew that it was really funny, did you then try to hit funny notes no, or no? No, 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 no. Well, we, it's truly, really laugh out loud funny. Um, I want to talk a little bit more generally about writing. Uh, Zadie Smith said in this wonderful essay called Fail Better, uh, when I write, I'm trying to express my way of being in the world. Uh, do you think you're doing that consciously or not? in this book? What did she say? When I write, I'm trying to express my way of being in the world. Um, no, I think I'm just trying to... I am trying to find out what it feels like to be another person. That's what I'm trying to do. Because we never know what it feels like to be another person. Um, which just blows me away. It's so amazing that we just spend our lives, you know, in in ourselves, and we don't know actually what it feels like to be another person. And that has always fascinated me. So I think that I am trying to find out what the interior life is of somebody else, and how that interior life bumps up against the real world. And um, I, I don't feel like I have that much to do with it, even though I'm obviously the person doing it. I'm just, I am trying to inhabit a different person and share that person with you, the reader, so that you may know what it's like to be a different person. And also maybe recognize parts of yourself that you didn't even know you recognized until you recognized them. But as a, what, as a preoccupation, though, your whole life, that in a yes. sense, it is what Zadie Smith said, because it is something that you've been struck by, that you've oh, thought yeah. about a lot, right? Oh, my whole life. Yeah. yeah. What is fiction, what can fiction offer? Is it solace? Is it something else? Well, I think, I mean, for me, as, as a fiction reader from a very young age, I can remember... I don't remember what the book was, but I can remember the first time when I was reading a book of fiction, and I remember thinking, oh, I've had that thought. And it was so exciting, because I didn't know anybody else had that thought. I don't even know what the thought was. But I remember thinking, I've had that thought. And so I think that books can provide, you know, can, can go from one living mind to another living mind and, and provide um, Comfort, yes, but more than that, more than that, larger than that. Give, I would hope to give people, even momentarily, some sense of relief, some sense that whatever they've thought or felt has been thought and felt before. Um, and hopefully, I would like it when people put down my books to just have a little moment of feeling like the world is larger than they thought or something, some tiny sense of momentary transcendence and just say, oh, okay. Well, I think that 
you can rest <laughs> assured that they are doing that. Um, there are so many lines in this book. I, I was like just folding down the edges of pages and double folding pages. But there's this beautiful line where she, Olive thinks, the things that happen in childhood do not go away. And it's she has these profound moments throughout. Yeah, she's not an idiot. No, but it's like a uni- no, not at all. There's this sort of unified view of the world. So you almost feel right. like you could write fortune cookie thoughts of hers, the reader, yeah. the, more, the more she reads it. Um, but I'm interested also in form, because I know you're a fan of the great Irish writer William Trevor, yeah. uh, the right. master short story writer, right. and most of his work is short stories, but he's also a novelist, was a, a novelist. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the exigencies of the short story and those of the novel? How different are they? Because this is, so these are novels in short stories? Is that? Oh, I a, don't know what they're. I know. You know, people, you can call it whatever you want to. It doesn't bother me. I mean, they happen, they happen to be short stories that make up a novel. So whatever you want to call it. But do you think a certain way, like now I'm in, now I wear my short story hat. Now I wear my novel hat. No, I just, I just realized that, um, you know, the, the form of the book is the book. So you have to, you have to understand, you know, what, what, you have to understand what you're going to do. I mean, that, because the style is substance, you see. And so if... Wait, what what it, do you mean? Well, I mean, if you're writing something like The Burgess Boys, which is, like, so complicated and has so many different stuff, and, and you know, it's, it has to be a more traditionally written novel because of the story itself. Something like Olive Kittredge is episodic. She's... That's what I think of her as, being episodic. And so I write it in episodes. And that came to me really immediately when I first met Olive um, at the picnic table, you know, standing there. And, um, and I just realized, OK, I'm going to write a book of, and call it The Olive Stories. But then as I was working on it, I realized, you know, she's an awful lot to take. And I don't want to see her on every page and I can't imagine my readers do either so that's when I decided to um, have other characters in the town which was very interesting to me because point of view is so interesting to me that I thought okay if we have somebody see her one way and then somebody else who sees her another way that's really what happens um, in life you know we think we know somebody but we only see a slice of them somebody else sees a different slice of them so that was how I came to this form. And this book opens, in fact, in that way, not yeah. with Olive. Right. Um, right. And did you know that was going to be the case? Well, as soon as I read that, wrote that story, The Poet, I realized, oh, she's married. You know, she just had just buried her second husband, so I've got to go back and marry her up. <laughs> so, and obviously Jack Kennison, the only person in the world left that would marry her. <laughs> and so... But that's, it's such a... Their relationship, though, them talking together, in bed together, it makes so much sense. Thank you. I thought, I it thought really, so. It Even doesn't feel like, jerry-rigged at all. No, exactly. And, and that, was, that was really interesting for me as I was working on Jack as well as Olive. I thought, this actually makes sense, you know? And he couldn't be more different from Henry, who was just the loveliest man in the world. Um, but they, they find a meeting ground. Yeah. Um, but So when you have these episodes, when is it during revision that you have to go, wait a minute, what do they add up to? Like the, the novel idea? Or do you understand, like the shape of the novel? I, I've mm. the, you know, the shape of the novel, I, d- I, I just, um, I don't worry about that as I'm writing it. I, like I just figure it'll happen. That's so great. Yeah, at this point, for but many years, I did you. Would, but you used when you wrote more traditional, like the Burgess Boys, right, which is a more traditional very, structure. Very difficult mess, and they're all it, they're always a mess. But um, but at this point in this uh, form, in this mm-hmm. kind of book, or in anything is possible. Um, even my name is Lucy Barton. Like I have a sense that it will come together if I'm just truthful as I write these different scenes, and one story will be good enough to last. Another one won't, um, and then, and then the positioning of the stories is just always immediately intuitive for me. 
Wow, that's incredible. I think it's a well. I've anyway. learned. I've learned to trust my intuition. I mean, that's really how I work. It's intuitive. Right. Yeah. 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 You also guide your characters through time so beautifully. Are you interested in time when you're writing? Because well, you make these leaps, you jump, yeah. and now w- when we learn that she's buried two husbands after seeing this marriage, right. uh, there's like a lot of white space. Right. You know, I learned that um, years ago with Amy and Isabel because I couldn't get I- Isabel out of the A.M.P. and then I finally realized, leave her there, just move on. Right. I oh, I mean, it was astonishing because well, I really you taught could- myself to write, so I had to learn. Leave her there. Go ahead, start something else, and she'll obviously not be there. When I know. We it's get back. I mean, it sounds so logical, but I had to actually learn that. No, I think most writers have to. Also, it's kind of like the, we kind of fear that the reader is done. Like we, I don't right. know what it. Like the reader will think if you leave characters in a restaurant. Wait, did they stay there all night? Yeah. What did? How, you know, you have to say they asked for check, please. No, that's the dullest sentence that right. nobody wants to read. You right. can trust. That's exactly right. If you put them in right. bed, they understand. Right. They got into their car. That's right. Yeah. But yeah. when you start writing, or even for a long time in your writing life, you don't know that. You have right. to trust yourself, I had to, right? I, I to had move to them really ahead. Learn that, time. and it was well, Isabel and the A and P that taught me that. It's amazing. It really, yeah. really, it really <laughs> works well. <laughs> have your feelings about? the needs of fiction changed at all in this midst of the crises of the world? Well, I have to admit that I do sometimes wonder what I'm doing by mm-hmm. writing fiction when what does it do all of when this is happening in the world. Um, but I can't do anything else. So I just, I keep writing fiction and I guess I hope that the fiction continues to do what I want it to do, which is to, you know, even momentarily broaden somebody's view of other people. What about Olive's political views? Because they're on display here. Yeah, well, they were on display in the other book, too, when she was talking about George Bush being cross-eyed coke addict. (laughs) Right. (laughs) It's very enjoyable. Yeah. But it's complicated, too, though, because there's that scene with Betty... And right, right. And Trump right, now in right. this book. And um, when there's a story with Olive has some medical issues, and when she comes home, she has two home health care um, people. One of them she refers to as Big Betty, and the other one is a Somali young woman from Shirley Falls. And Betty has a bumper sticker of um, that orange-haired president. <laughs> and Olive will not drive in that truck, even though... She needs to go to the doctor. She has Big Betty drive her car to the doctor because she would literally rather die than be seen in that truck. But the ending of that story is interesting. Yeah. So, anyway. I was thinking of that. No, there's a, there's yeah, a shift. There is a shift. And, it, and, that, and when I realized that, I thought, now the story works. That's right. Yeah. Right, right, right. So if you feel hopeless about the world... What happens when you're writing? Like, is, does it just go away and you're just all olive all the time? Um, kind of. <laughs> so good. Which is like not a bad, well, never mind, you know, just given everything, whatever. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Now, um, so in the world, olive has sort of caught on and, and you've gotten such wonderful, you've had such a wonderful uh, I don't know, your, your writing life and, and your readership is just huge and, and terrific. And I, did winning the Pulitzer change your relationship to writing in any way? Were you afraid it would? Um, winning the Pulitzer, the only, th- you know, I wasn't young when I won it. I was like 53 or something. It was different from being, you know, <laughs> well, it's different from being 23 and winning it, you know, so, I mean, but and I had been writing for so long without anybody really noticing or caring that when I won the Pulitzer, the only thing that changed for me was, uh, except it didn't change because I, I felt like I have always had a high sense of responsibility to my readers. I think about my readers when I'm writing and I have a real sense of responsibility to my readers and I thought, now I have more readers, so. 
I have to be more responsible. But then I realized, well, I'm always trying to be as responsible as I can, so nothing actually changed. What do you, what do you owe your readers? Oh, I owe them everything. I owe them, I owe them an experience that they can take away and that they can, that can maybe, you know, affect them in some way that's, like I said, that's like almost comforting or, or, you know, I mean, readers, you know, they, there are many responses that people can have and I need to make sure. And I think about, I have an ideal reader um, because many years ago I figured, oh, if I, make, if I can make up characters, I can make up an ideal reader. So I did. So who is, your, who is this person? Well, it's not male or female or anything in between, um, but it's a, it's a presence, and I know this reader. The reader is patient, but not super patient. Um, Kind-hearted, but not super kind-hearted. It's just somebody who is waiting to see if I can deliver what I need to deliver. It's almost like we're in a dance, and I have to be in the lead. Is it you without your experiences? Who, my ideal reader? Yeah. No. No, it's a made-up reader. Liz, we've invited her here, him, her here tonight. <laughs> um, well, I'm thinking about you're not, you know, picturing the person exactly, and that's reminding right. me of well, of characters. Do you? Uh, this is a question I always want to know from writers. Do you see their faces? You know, that's such an interesting question because not really, but kind of. Right. Not the way you might think that I see their faces. Um, I see their internal life and and I have a sense of their bodily existence. Like Olive, you know, starts out as a big woman. She's just gotten a little older, so she's shrunk a little bit, but she's still, she's a big woman. And I understood that about her immediately. And I can sort of see her face, but not Totally. Yeah, I think that's true probably for most yeah, writers. it's interesting. So I then wanted to ask you because, well, we have something in common in that we both had adaptations of our books written by the writer Jane Anderson who won the Emmy for her HBO adaptation of Olive Kitteridge and she wrote, uh, an adap- she wrote the film based on my book The Wife with Glenn Close. And I wrote a piece for the Times Book Review about exactly what I was just asking you about the face being blurry, but then when Glenn Close played the character and the wife, when I thought about it for a while, we'll see how, what happens over time, it became Glenn Close. Did that happen at all with Frances McDormand? No. <laughs> no, I, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, you know, Frances, I think Frances is pretty. You know, you know, whatever, and 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 so she she had her olive, and she did a wonderful job. But it was a but it wasn't variation my, on a theme. It wasn't my olive, and so my olive came back to me as my olive. Wow. Um, so when you leave a character behind in a book, um, is it grief that you feel? No. <laughs> That's great. I always feel like I'm leaving them suspended in an enclosed world, like at the end of the Truman Show. There's this sort of bubble. Don't readers ask you what happens to this one, what happens to this one? Do they, do you never hear from readers? Well, now you've told them some things about Olive with this book, with what happened. Right. Um, uh, No, I don't think readers particularly ask me once in a while. No. What do they ask you? What what has been? Has there been some theme that's come about in recent years that readers really want, searchingly want to know? No. All right. Well, <laughs> we may find know. out tonight because we'll have, have questions you in have a minute. To ask me. I, uh, I mean, um, I, uh, with with the with the first Olive Kittredge, I I was very very struck when I went out on the road with the original Olive Kittredge. What really struck me was how many women said to me, leaned in and said to me very confidentially, you must have a (laughs) daughter-in-law. (laughs) 
And I said, no, I don't. I don't even have a son. <laughs> and um, what I was aware of was how many women out there want to steal their daughter-in-law's bra. <laughs> they want to steal one shoe and make her feel a little crazy. Well, you did that it. was very interesting you to me. You did it for those of them who can't. Right, exactly. That's fantastic. Listen, speaking of finding out what readers want, let's open this up to questions. There's one back there. I'll bring you the microphone. Thank you. I find it so interesting that, sh that your character, Olive, your other, is somebody who doesn't um, go by the rules. And I th um, think that that is something that right. taps into, or resonates with all of us, because we're so constrained by That's how we behave. That's interesting. That's very, very interesting, right. And I also wondered whether, because Olive is such a forceful, dynamic person, whether she has ever spoken to you, or if you have ever imagined a conversation between you and Olive. No. <laughs> um, that's a good question, but no, she's Olive, and I, I made her up, and I write about her, and we don't have a relationship other than that. <laughs> okay, uh, there's one. Up Which here? is enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, hang on. There's a there's a mic coming to you. Oh, yeah. uh, I liked your example about stealing the bra. When, you, when I read that, I thought you had done it. No, I didn't. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Oh, Come on, Liz, fess I up. I used to steal my sister's belt if she was going out with somebody who oh, was mad at her. Okay, so or that's... the dress, whatever she wanted. Right. But anyway, my question, I have a couple of questions. One, your short stories um, in, uh, uh, oh, not, something... A anything is possible? Uh, no, happened. Oh. Uh, every, anything can happen. Right, anything, right. Right. And only one has Lucy Barton. Right. So does your book, Lucy Barton, now follow in and fit into that one? What, what's the question again? Does Oh, does Lucy Barton fit with that as um, your new book fits with all of You know, yes, I mean, I think so, yes. I, I do think, I think almost in an inverse way. Right. You know, right. because... Right, yeah, I thought, you know, I saw the picture. Right, because you've got My Name is Lucy right. Barton, which is her right. story from her own voice, the only um, thing I ever wrote in first person except for the prologue and the Burgess Boys, right. which nobody ever remembers, but anyway. Um, so, so Lucy Barton has her own story, and then the stories of the people okay. that she has spoken of with her mother and different people that knew her. So it's almost an inverse of the olive thing. Okay. Right, right. You know. I saw the picture yeah. of that. Yeah. Then I have one last question. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you ever read um, uh, uh, Oliphant. Uh, Eleanor Oliphant is perfectly fine. No, I have not read that. Oh, because your characters are so real and I loved uh, Eleanor Oliphant, and I would love to in, have introduced her to um, oh, <laughs> Olive, right, but I right, guess I can't yeah. do that. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much, though. There's one back there. Back there. Hi. Yes, actually, my question's uh, follow-up. Um, could you talk a little bit about point of view and voice? Uh, you chose third person for right. Olive, first person for Lucy Bard. Um, yeah. Why and, and and yet both give us an internal life. What advantage disadvantage? Right. Uh, and why did you choose? Right. That, um, that? Right. I, I I'm much. I feel more comfortable writing in third person because um, in first person you're limited. You can only see what that person sees. Therefore, you have to use other characters' responses to them to get depth from what they are seeing. Whereas if I'm writing in third person, um, the narrative voice can shift around and tell many things to the reader about the person. So I'm usually much more comfortable writing in third person because I love point of view. And with the first person, you're only going to get that one point of view, except, you know, like I said, you've got to you finagle it around with other characters letting you know that they're responding to her in some way, but um, 
Right. So I, I think I'm pretty much a third person point of viewer. Hi, to go back to the stealing the shoe episode, I think that was a moment when I fell helplessly in love with Olive in the yeah. first book. And I remember in an interview you did back with that book, you said that you had such glee and enjoyment oh, writing I loved that it. scene. And you really let her go and yeah. gave her kind of untrammeled oliveness. And right. I was wondering if you had any moments in this book that you particularly enjoyed writing. Well, I mean, this book was, I, I mean, I did enjoy that, but I have to tell you that, that you know, stealing the shoe and the bra, that, that was just a wonderful day at work. <laughs> I will never forget that day. It was just wonderful, because it came as such a surprise. You know, I was just standing there in the bedroom, I mean, with her inside her in the bedroom, and looking at the bureau and thinking, what are we going to do, Olive? You know, we'll open the drawer, and oh, there are all these little bras. And then I just thought, oh. Boy, that was fun. It was just so fun. And, and I can remember it. And in this book, um, there, were, there were many things that were fun. The end of the Civil War days, oh, that's um, which is not an olive story particularly. I, I just thought, I just had so much fun writing that one. Um, I'm not going to tell you about it, because you haven't read it, right? Oh, you did read it. Yeah. Did you like it? <laughs> is that the most pathetic story? I mean, no, my story, asking you if you liked it. <laughs> I worried about it, you know, but I, I, for obvious reasons, I mean, it just seemed a little bit over the top, but I just thought it was just too good <laughs> to not use. But anyway, thank you. It's so good. It's so good. Mm -hmm. uh, any other I'm questions? I'm so sorry. There's something way in the back. What, no, no, this is... What a terrible thing to say. Did you like it? Yeah. Uh, You're the Sally Field of thing. writers. <laughs> Very sorry. Thank you. I spent an inordinate... inordinate what, I spent a lot of time looking for um, books and authors that I'm willing to to read, and, and when I discovered you only a few days ago, um, I, I bought both of the uh, audio books, and I thought, I think I can probably get through them before I come to this talk. And I'm so thankful that I didn't, because I'm only in the first couple chapters of the first book, and I've been thinking, something must happen that makes her, like, s get nicer. <laughs> and yeah. now I relax and enjoy her for exactly who she is. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, the, the first, I know what you're talking Well, you know, that's just who she was at that point in time. And, yeah. Thank you. I'm looking you're forward welcome. To it. Uh, had one over here. Hi. Um, I loved the way that you had Olive play mere cameos in a number of the stories, like the one in the new book about the teenage girl who cleans yes. people's houses. Yes. Um, I, I thought that was yes. such a bold choice for you to do that. Could you talk about right. the decision to do all those cameos of Olive? You know, that, that cameo of Olive came quite naturally because I realized, okay, we've got Kaylee Callahan. You know, she's at this nursing home, which is not a very fancy nursing home to visit her upstairs neighbor that she loved, loves. Kaylee loved her because Kaylee has love in her heart, you know. And then all of a sudden to have Olive show up, it, it was just a perfect counterpoint. And Olive, you know, says, boy, I hope to hell they shoot me before I have to go in a place like this. And the and it was just it was just kind of perfect, and I saw that that is something that Olive would do for a girl like Kaylee Callahan, and um, so that that became a natural part. And then you know meeting her in the donut shop, and and letting her know what the story really is with that man and stuff like that, um, that just arose, like as soon as I had Kaylee at the um, nursing home, I thought oh. Olive's going to come through that door. But it's a testament, Liz, to the power of this character that we are waiting for her, kind of like the Hitchcock cameo in every movie. <laughs> We're waiting for her. We want to be with her. You, yeah. you made that happen. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's really true. Um, was there one, there's, uh, was there one, one, one over here? So it's, it's been a while since I read the first Olive, so I might be remembering incorrectly, but um, 
I don't remember her being very self-reflective. Like she just would act and she was comfortable with the way she acted and then just moved on. Whereas this book, I feel like she's, she's evolving so much and she's so self-reflective and she'll say something and then think, oh, actually that's, I, I shouldn't have said that or I didn't right. mean that. Like she's just, and I, and I, I find myself like, as I get older, I kind of am like a better person. <laughs> right, exactly. And I just don't know if that you just but, thought but of that because no, she did, got older. I, or? I, in my mind, um, I think there's a myth that people have that when you reach a certain age, you just stay there. I just not true. It's just absolutely not true. We constantly keep growing if we have been growing, or we diminish if we have been diminishing. And Olive struck me as a person who, at that end of that book, when, her Hen when Henry is dead and she's, you know, she has absorbed her blows, I saw her as a woman who actually was growing. So she continues to grow in this next book. Yeah. Very much, yeah. Hi, um, thank you both. This has been great. Um, I, I think that one of the reasons why we love Olive is we all have so many people in our lives who are imperfect. Yes, and right. And learning to love an imperfect person right. is, is part of maturing. And um, I just want to say I think that fiction is one of the most comforting things around and I don't want you to stop. Oh, <laughs> please. Thank you. Either of you. Uh, <laughs> thank I just ha you. A, an unfair question, perhaps. Do you have a book that you particularly love in your... Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I constantly, I have um, a couple of copies of the collected stories of William Trevor. No, but the, of your books. Oh, of my book. Oh. Yeah, is there, do you have a favorite child? Uh, that's the unfair part. No, I know. Um, you know, I, I have a certain sense of affection for the the one that I'm working on mm -hmm. usually. Yeah. Um, and I am working on one, but no, I I I don't. Okay. Thank think you. So thank you. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much. This has been really wonderful. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your writing process. Is there a typical day, or does it depend on what project you're working on? Thank you. Um, well, a typical day, um, you know, a typical day. Like, I, I will, um, I like to work as soon as I'm done with breakfast. Because I feel, which may be, let's just say I'm not an early bird. Um, anyway, so I like to I'd like to start work as soon as I'm done with my breakfast because I feel like that's when I'm freshest and nothing of the day has come into it yet. So I will work um, until lunch. You know, I'll try and push lunch off because there's something about having lunch that breaks it for me, and I know that. So I, you know, I'll be like really, really hungry and still trying to work, but then I get too hungry, so I work, and that breaks it. And then I might look at it later on in the afternoon or not. It's always risky to do that because if you think you've had a good day at work and then you look at it and you go, oh, no, I didn't. And then you have to wait until the next day. But you might have actually done something good and then you can be all happy all evening. So it, that's, that's risky. Um, but I, but, so that's how I work, but, I, but, I, but the process is not, like I said, I don't write from beginning to end and I, I write in scenes. And, and I have learned over the years to write in scenes and that the scenes, if they're good enough, will eventually connect with each other. So I never worry about plot, because it just will happen. And it's also just an awful word. <laughs> My friend calls it plod. Yeah, yeah. it's a horrible word. Ooh. So we have time for maybe one last question, if anybody. One last, no, is there no one? Here's one right here. What is it about Maine? Why are there so many uh. authors and artists there? Uh, Richard Russo, Stephen King, you, poets. Mm. 
Well, you know, Maine is a strange place. It's, and I really am from Maine, you know. Those other people aren't, by the way. <laughs> Just letting you know. And that to be from Maine means you have to have been there for, you know, a number of generations, which I have been. 1603 was my earliest ancestor in Maine. So it's kind of horrible, you know. So you're just super, so it's just its own place and, and that, it's, it's, um, it's pretty, it's beautiful because the light hits in a way that, because it's so northern, the, the, the light will slant. Every time of the year, it slants a different way. It's just gorgeous. Olive talks about the February light. Right, it's a beautiful exactly. It's here. just yeah. beautiful. The light is beautiful. But it's, it's, it's a, you know, I don't know what to say about Maine. <laughs> thank you. Well, listen, thank you all so much for coming. Read thank this fabulous book. It's so wonderful.